Well, thank you. I thought it was a, a, a really appreciate being part of such a robust conversation on the sustainable development goals and also uh, the fact that we've started touching on the fact that there's an African Union 2063 aspirations that has been set out. Uh, seven uh, objectives set out through these, or seven aspirations defined by the African Union for development in Africa. Just a, a point of reflection, I, I always find that with development goals, um, remember we had the Millennium Development Goals and, and we've got the National Development Plan, which I thought was also brilliant, brilliant that it's being unpacked the way it is at this forum. The, the challenge that we always sit with, particularly with the fundamental science, is that you have a situation where the scientific project tries and justifies its existence by trying to plug into these SDGs or these development goals. Um, and what I'm enjoying about this debate is that uh, we are it creates an opportunity for a project to come in, present itself, and one can evaluate the project by its alignment to the principles of the SDGs and see where it can improve upon or how it can better align itself, better have its output speak to those to those particular um, uh, indicators. Uh, and therefore, my, my the topic of my of my presentation, radio astronomy and SDGs, is this a justification or a solution? Um, I, I also want to point to the fact that we, the Minister of Science and Technology, has now declared us a South African Radio Astronomy Observatory. I am the communications manager of to also. We, we are now part of a surveyor structure, which means that all radio astronomy facilities across the country is now under one umbrella institution. So SKA, Hartrow. Uh, we, we fall under this particular facility. And the image at the bottom there is, uh, is the SKA site in, in, in the Karoo, uh, where we're building this mammoth uh, telescope, starting with the construction of Meerkat, which is more of the Karoo Array telescope. So I'm just going to start the presentation by giving a little bit of introduction to, to SKA and, and, and particularly Meerkat, and, and look at the data um, the type of data challenges that a project like this poses for a scientific community. Uh, this is the Gregorian Offset Telescope that is being built, which is the Meerkat Telescope, uh, a precursor instrument to, to the SKA project. Now, I've been asked, uh, what is radio telescopy? What, what does a radio telescope actually do? Now, what I would encourage you to do is, if you look up, we've got these beautiful lights on the ceilings. And your naked eye is able to observe these lights given the frequencies that your eye has been adjusted to observe, Those, these, these frequencies that are, that are sending down, so you can see the light. But if you were to look at the same light through an ultraviolet camera, you'll be seeing a different, different set of, of, of lights, energies. In fact, what you will be seeing is, is the, the type of heat that's being emitted from, from these lights. So, What's great about uh, astronomy is that you, you're using different types of instruments to observe celestial ob objects in the sky or in the heavens. Uh, with optical, you observe a certain set of frequencies. With radio, you're able to look at the type of energies that are being dispensed by around those objects. You're also able to look at some characterization, knowing that most of the universe is made up of hydrogen, so we're very careful to detect where those, where those hydrogen atoms are coming from, what they look like. Um, and and you, if you if you were to put a telescope outside of our outside of our our uh, the Earth's atmosphere, you'd be able to look at ultraviolet and infrared observations uh, of 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 the universe. And you need the combination of all of these telescopes to get a full understanding of the universe. So radio telescopy only deals with one particular aspect of that of understanding the frequencies of what is being emitted with the radiation that is coming down onto the Earth. This is ultimately what, the, what, what ISCA A will look like. Um, so Meerkat is a construction of 64 antennas, uh, of these antennas, and then ISCA A Phase 1, which is a mid-frequency antenna. Remember, both South Africa and Australia won the bid to host ISCA A, so they will be hosting the low-frequency antennas, and in Africa, we'll be hosting the mid-frequency antennas. So 64 of Meerkat, eventually to be integrated into SKA Phase 1, we will be introducing an additional 130 antennas. Uh, so that will bring just under 200 antennas in SKA Phase 1. And SKA Phase 1 would be approximately 10% of the entire SKA project. 
So you're looking at possibly 2,500 to 3,000 antennas across the Africa with its core in the Karoo area. Um, this is a close-up image of, of, of Meerkat uh, with a receiver immediately in your, in your immediate view and, and the receiver would then also, on the, sorry, with the indexer on the immediate view and the indexer also houses different data processing instrumentation like a digital converter, uh, the correlator which then makes sure that all of these, all the data that's collected can be received and observed as a single, as a single image. Eventually, um, the, uh, the SKA will be built across nine African partner countries, which includes South Africa. The furthest north is Ghana, and we've had the privilege to launch that instrument in Ghana just a week ago, I think. Um, yeah, um, yeah, 24 August, a week ago. Um, and so that was the very first instrument in, as part of the conversion project to build these instruments across the across Africa. The significance of building an instrument or doing also doing scientific observations from Ghana means that for the very first time in history a pan-African baseline was used across two instruments in Africa to do uh, to, to, to observe the sky. Previously you'll be using a European baseline, so you'll use the number of instruments across Europe and before we always did that with the Hartrow instrument just around the corner from us. We speak Gauteng language. Just around the corner in Hartrow, we, we always used to connect the European baseline to Hartrow and that formed a very long baseline interferometry. But at the first time that we were able to do so with the instrument that we converted and launched in Ghana last week was a pan-African baseline. And ultimately these instruments will form one very long African baseline of instruments uh, through which making the continent one big radio telescope, which I like. So, so you've got as far north as Ghana, as far east as Mauritius and Madagascar, and then obviously uh, the other countries within the SADC region, um, such as uh, Namibia, Botswana, and um, Mozambique. So data being the new oil, um, or the future oil, or the current oil, we, we look at what sort of data expectations are the or, or historically has been used in radio astronomy. Uh, from early 2000 when we used the VLA um, to more recently with Meerkat and the construction of ASCAP in Australia to what is being promised would be the data, uh, the data processing power of these instruments. So you can see a significant growth, exponential growth, um, particularly from Meerkat through to the completion of SKA. So how would this work? So you've got huge amount of data, this, this radiation that falls upon the antenna, um, the collection area of the dish, about two terabytes per second. So if you were to look at your average DVD, your, you know, your, your, your normal uh, movies DVD, I think that's about two gigs, 2.5 gigs. So you're looking at 500 of those being collected per second, and then having to be processed, and then we, 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 we will obviously process that at various um, processing centers. There's a processing center in the Karoo, and then with the assistance of the high performance computing facility at the CSR, uh, we've got a facility in Cape Town that will, f that will make sure that the images are prepared so that the scientists can make sense of it, and in turn allow us to make sense of it, and, and then also make sure that that data is available for further research following the initial um, science uh, commissioning. So. In order to achieve this, so what you normally do with a, a project of the scale is that you're trying to test technological boundaries so that you can innovate um, and therefore make sure that those innovations belong home. So it was very visionary for South Africa to host, an, uh, to host or participate in a project like this because having SKA in Africa, having SKA in South Africa means that we will be leading the process of pushing those technological boundaries in data processing, data imaging, and that means that we will be at the cusp of, of this economy of big data, being able to lead the rest of the world in this area. Uh, it means a lot of collaborations, both internally and externally, it's not a, a, a silo-focused implementation, and the applications of it needs to have uh, needs to be used within industry, and most importantly is that the design and the 
innovation and the solving of the problems are done in partnership with local uh, South African high-tech industry. So it's not only just international high-tech industry, we're also using the expertise locally so that skill can be built here. Um, the last time when I presented, I also spoke about uh, the reversal of what this project allows to, is to is address the issue of brain drain. In fact, it, 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 it brings about reversal of brain drain because you're bringing, having these high, large in science infrastructure projects in your country will draw expertise from across the world and they, they're too happy to be close to the instruments. Ultimately, we're building expensive equipment for the scientists to play with, aren't we? So if we can draw them into our country, that means that they will be nurturing the talent locally. And, and, and we can see how that is already translated into the number of PhDs and postdoctoral qualifications that come off from this project. Another interesting realization that's come out from the data challenge is the establishment of an interdata or, or data intensive astronomy, sorry, Inter University Institute for Data Intensive Astronomy, IDEA which currently uh, has five universities participating, including the Solplaiki University in the Northwest province. So um, what it means is that you create tier facilities that are able to process the data, make the data available, but also the infrastructure so that that data can be used across a number of facilities. Um, this would mean that your data infrastructure is expanded across a number of facilities. So that is made available for across a number of research institutions. What's in What's the, the idea of this IDEA facility is so that we can start, start off using astronomy data, but ultimately it's also now testing or running prototypes for the establish, establishment of an African data intensive research cloud facility or an ARC, African research cloud facility, which where that same infrastructure can be made available for other fundamental science research areas. Um, uh, such as epidemiology or, or pharmaco uh, pharmacokinetics or other, or other research areas, genomics that needs, uh, that needs the processing of large data. So, so when you start thinking about a sustainable development goals and a research project like this, without too much of a stretch of an Im imagination, one can start seeing that, that an a fundamental science such as this could possibly speak to those development goals. But I want that to be a natural fit. A fit. It shouldn't be something that, that you feel is forced upon you. So allow me to continue the presentation. Um, if you look at, uh, so we're all familiar, or we, many of us may be familiar with, with, um, with the African undersea cables that are sitting across the, across the continent um, um, with the aim to provide this connectivity across the globe. The problem with that, though, is that if you look at the entry points of, those, of that uh, undersea data cable facility onto the African continent, which is mostly terrestrial, they do not stretch very much further than their point of entry. And that's because the infrastructure for extending, that, for extending the data cable connection, the, inf, uh, the, the optical fiber connection across the continent is, is not, doesn't exist at the moment. Um, and if you, if you refer to, to the, Africa, the AU aspirations, one of the key drivers that has been identified to further that those aspirations is transformation around the adoption or, 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 or facilitating transformation by the adoption and coordination of digital technology. I'm going to quote what is written in the 2063 agenda when it says it identified itself as being ambitious, the 50 year uh, development agenda, and, and the way it, it hopes to make sure that its um, aspirations are, mater are realized is by call having these call to actions, one of them being catalyzing education and skills revolution and actively promoting science, technology and research and innovation to build knowledge, human capital, capabilities and skills to drive innovations. Um, which I thought was quite a mature um, aspect of that particular document. So, taking a few steps back, if you, if you look at SKA and Meerkat, so there are two potential areas where there are technological development. One is around an area called radio frequency interference. And because of radio frequency interference, we have, it's given rise to many innovations that we are using every day, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth being a few. Um, so, so RFI 
or radio frequency interference, given the fact that you need a telescope to operate in a very low RFI environment, forces technology in this area to be developed in innovation. The other is this whole big data challenge. And if you look at the technological developments around this particular instrument, you'll see that three of them are already speaking specifically to big data. The one is around storage um, and retrieval, software development, so making sure that that data can be interpreted into images, um, and, the, and the processing power of, of that data through high performance computing. Other applications of big data, uh, just to bring that into context, would be smarter healthcare, um, security, if, we, if we're able to monitor huge amounts of data, we can really start through imaging, identify whether, whether the object we're looking at is, is, is a passive uh, object which will not pose any security risk like an animal or whether it is uh, an object that could pose potential risk. And the only way to teach a computer or to teach a machine, machine learning, is through processing large volumes of data. Traffic control, manufacturing, um, transportation. Um, most of our connected devices have extended to, to transport uh, uh, mechanisms like aircrafts and cars so that the diagnostics of that can be sent back to a central place. So by the time the aircraft lands, the, the mechanics are already aware of what services that machine will need. Um, telecommunication, as we're all aware of, trading analytics, um, I, I went, I had the privilege of attending a, a, a lecture um, on quantum physics and how quantum physics relates to the economy and through a period of a few microseconds or nanoseconds you'd be able to analyze the dip or the changes within the economy and if one were to, or, or stock market and if one were to able to zoom in on those areas you'd be better be able to predict uh, stock market activity into the future but that requires huge data processing power. <coughs> 